talked about in come tempest. 6.30 come tempest means with time, which means 6.45. <laughs> I got it. <laughs> yeah. That's a very civilized approach, I think. So there's a German word for that, probably. Yeah, probably. <laughs> okay, so so I'm going to... Hi, Gary. Hey, Bruce. How you doing? Good. So um, I'm going to, to introduce... Um, Neil Bertram. Neil got up at 2.30 in the morning in, in England to, uh, to do this presentation for us. Uh, he's, he's what I call a renaissance man. You, you can engage him on any topic and uh, he, he'll have something, something useful to, to say. And tonight, his talk is going to be Earth Science and the Attraction of Mountains, a historic snapshot from the 17th to 19th centuries. Neil Bertram. And you are recording, right, Bruce? I am. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, I've had a few tech problems, so I'm not sure if this is all working, but uh, hopefully everyone can see my presentation screen. Um, I, I guess I should start by saying that uh, I have no particular expertise in this topic, and I'm aware that there's a lot of people on this call who have spent their lives studying the cosmos. So uh, I apologize in advance for a rather pet patchy and uh, probably incomplete uh, summary, but hopefully it will be interesting. So, I had our first glitch, for some reason I can't change the slide, just bear with me. It doesn't seem to be an option. Just go to full screen. Right, okay. So topics I'm planning to talk about, um, first of all, I'm going to talk about why this particular topic interests me uh, particularly. Uh, I'm going to talk about the historical context because I'm, ta I'm talking about the, uh, the 17th century on really, and there's more background to it than, you know, there was obviously a situation already developed. I will talk about how hypotheses developed in the 17th century and then how the attraction of mountains actually became mountains of attraction. And then finally, a, an experiment to quantify the, uh, the attraction of mountains. Sure sounds a bit cryptic. Um, so, you're probably looking at this slide and wondering why I'm showing a, a picture of a 1970s beauty pageant. Um, in actual fact, what this is, is uh, my way of representing the summer of 1976. Uh, I believe you had a similar summer in the continental US uh, where the, we had a drought and constant sunshine for something like 12 weeks, I think it was. And the, the, the impact of the drought was that there was no water, well, water was rationed and water had to be collected from standpipes or water bowels or deliveries. But for me, uh, as a 15 year old, it was also the year of my first geography field trip. And we took a trip to a mountain in Wales, well, in fact, Wales, and one of the mountains we visited was Cadaridris, which is a heavily glaciated mountain that uh, lies on the coast of uh, North Wales. I remember being absolutely spellbound really by that trip. I re recall sort of wonderment at the fact that I was standing on rocks that were formed 600 million years ago. That I was walking down glaciated valleys that had been eroded and modified by water flow. The, the tons and tons of scree lying on the slopes from free, uh, freeze for, for weathering. And in particular, I think one of the things that really captured my imagination was that uh, at the entrance of the Cum, where the outflow of the uh, glaciated lake was, there were some very deep striations in the rock, which were due to the grinding of the rock by boulders, which were being carried down by the slow moving glaciers in the Ice Age. And it had me smell spellbound. So that led to me joining the, when I went to university, joining the university hiking club and walking a lot of it, a lot of Great Britain. 
and the photos you see there on the top right, uh, the, that was on uh, a peak in the Lake District. Bottom left is a, a peak on Sky, and in fact this, uh, this, this area, Sky you can see is an area of route called Collie's Ledge. Uh, it's tackled without ropes and it's quite exciting. I also, as a result of the trips to Scotland, found myself visiting a, a hiking up a mountain called Shehalian. And Shehalian was the site for the experiment to quantify the attraction of mountains. And I've, it, it's, again, it, it, for some reason it's entranced me. And um, I've been back there many times. The, Photo in the top right hand corner is from my very first trip there in, 19, in 1983. And then the bottom photos are from my late last trip, which was in 2018 when uh, I introduced my son to the delights of Shahalian. <coughs> so that. The speaker is muted. Neil, we can't hear you. I'm unmuted now. I can't. I can't hear him anyway. Can Wrong. you hear me now? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I hope you didn't lose too much of that. Um, Give us the last uh, ten seconds. The last ten seconds was uh, really where it's time for me to shut up about me and start talking about the science. <laughs> okay. So. Uh, Really, the story started in the 15th century. Prior to the 15th century, mountains were seen as nothing more than obstacles. The view of mountains was flavoured by ancient suspicions. So pretty, normally, any wilderness was viewed as a place of foreboding uh, and evil. Evil spirits would often live there. Monsters would often be there. And anyone who said they were going to go for a a few days in the wilderness would probably be seen as slightly balmy. And, and, and so really the, the world had shown little interest in the mountains. They were just there and no one really cared about them. But in earth science terms, the, really, the view that potentially we had a heliocentric universe where the sun was at the center of the of solar system, I should say, the sun was at the center of the solar system, was, a, was something which had been aired but really wasn't permitted by scripture because the, the earth was the center of everything. And so really the first significant event was that Copernicus uh, showed that the, the earth or the, the motion of the planets that were known about all made a lot more sense and became a lot more simple if you looked at a heliocentric solar system instead of a geocentric solar system. And then he started really following on from Copernicus, Galileo, then with the, his use of the telescope, he, he discovered more planets and also, there were moons circling planets, so he found four of Jupiter's moons, for example. But most significantly, he also found that there were phases to Venus. And the, the fact that Venus had phases could only be explained by a heliocentric universe, uh, solar system. Now, up till that point, everything had been... all science as it were which wasn't really science was really dictated by religious dogma and um, christian religious dogma and the church had a very significant power base based on the, the that dogma and so there was a lot of resistance in the church to any ideas like that they, this they were considered blasphemous and in part i think that was probably down to piety but also there was there was probably as well some concern to protect the people's power and the wealth that the church possessed. And in fact, probably many of you know that uh, Galileo actually was forced to recant his views. There's some suggestion that he was tortured to do that, but that seems unlikely. 
but he certainly was persuaded to recant his view of a uh, heliocentric solar system and he spent the last 10 years of his life under house arrest now uh, you know there was house arrest in church palaces so it couldn't have been too bad a deal but all the same he was not permitted to propagate those views that he had so scientific truth was there was a real curiosity for scientific truth but there was also a real atmosphere of fear that be a risky career decision Oops, sorry so we against that background of dogma religious dogma one of the first attempts to age the earth was by the reverend james usher he um and he relied on a literal interpretation of the bible so he looked at the the scriptures he looked at family dynasties uh, reigns of rulers and good the construction of temple temples and he constructed a timeline for all of this and he then correlated that timeline with other sources that he could find that he thought were credible such as the Babylonian Greek and Roman writings. At the end of the, that exercise, he came up with a surprisingly precise date, which was the 26th, that the Earth was formed on the 26th of October, 4004 BC. And according to some sources, he also put a time against that based on the, an interpretation of the creation and which day um, um, and the time that uh stamps that effectively are in the bible and there were other attempts to age the earth as well and all used a largely similar method probably the although ushers was the most widely distributed um the other one which was also very common was one by thomas malthus who was also a um a respected source but he came up with a very similar figure so I put this up and I will instantly say this is not my work and it's not something I've had a chance to verify but this is a typical example of how the uh, the timeline was constructed so he worked backwards from Adam and Eve and creation through to what was then the present day So leading into the uh, 17th century, there was still this curiosity and an interest in the science. And so people started testing these hypotheses that not just the age of the earth, but the formation of the earth. And again, one of the most significant people in this was, uh, again, a reverend. Uh, this was the Reverend Thomas Burnett. And he produced a book called The Sacred Theory of the Earth. And that really described the, a, the described four ages of the earth, the origin, which he accepted religious dogma on, and then the great deluge, which was obviously the flood and, and uh, the ark, etc. And then he was looking forward to the universal conflagration where the earth would end in fire and flame and then the consumption of all things when everybody moved to the new Eden. But he was deeply troubled by one fact because the, he calculated that in order for all the, all the land on earth to be covered, he would need eight oceans of water. And according to his calculations, which I guess must have had a huge amount of uh, assumption in them, but according to his calculations, 40 days and 40 nights of rain would only deliver a single ocean's worth of water. So clearly not enough, in his opinion, to have the impact <laughs> that uh, the Great Flood did. So he came up with the a theory which was no, uh, described as the hollow egg. And according to this theory, the, the Earth was like a Russian doll. It was hollow in the center, but then it had a series of layers. and. The outermost layer was this perfect unblemished crust that was completely smooth and was perfection as obviously the Almighty would only create something that was perfect. 
And his explanation of the Great Flood was that with the, the there would have been great heat generated during the formation of the Earth, and due to the uh, due to the drying out of the Earth, this crust would slowly become brittle, and in fact, eventually, it would collapse in upon itself. And so, he described the flood as be, basically being due to the Earth collapsing in on itself, and the mountains and topology that we that he could see was down to this great cataclysmic event and was basically the detritus that was left over after the Great Flood. One thing he didn't challenge was the, the fact that the, year was, uh, the, the Earth was 6,000 years old. There was no reason to challenge it. The, a 6,000 year old Earth would still fit with the, his theory of the Four Ages. And although he trod quite carefully in deriving this and presenting this uh, theory, it was, it was not met with a great deal of enthusiasm, in some, certainly from the church. It was seen as blasphemous. And the, the theory of the earth, the sacred theory of the earth was re, was updated by Burnett throughout his lifetime, really, throughout the rest of his lifetime. He kept on having to defend against attacks against it. And each time he would issue a new version, I believe there were 16 editions ultimately uh, that were produced. There's also a suggestion that Burnett had been eschewing to be the head of the English church and uh, Archbishop of Canterbury. That never happened, and there is a suggestion that maybe that the reason for that was because of his blasphemy in the sacred theory of the earth. So this is slightly out of sequence, actually, but I thought I really want to mention the great man, Sir Isaac Newton. In some ways, he was a bit part player in this, and in other ways, he was absolutely fundamental to the, this story because in the context of mountains and the attraction of mountains, the, his great uh, achievement was the, uh, the for derivation of the universal gravitational equation. And he, this was published in 1687 in Principa, and he, uh, he's actually speculated, having postulated that this, there was this force of gravity he speculated that he, it would be possible to measure gravity by two methods. Uh, one was by putting two spheres very close together and then just on a frictionless surface and then just waiting for the two spheres to, to meet. And the other method he proposed was to look at the deviation of a pendulum when held close to a mountain or other very large mass to see the horizontal deflection of it due to the attraction of the mountain. And surprisingly, the, he actually got his sums wrong in, in this. And he, in the case of the spheres, he estimated it would take, um, take months for the, uh, um, or it would take up to a month for the two spheres to attract. If you do the calculations, it's minutes. And in terms of the, um, the the pendulums, he felt that there was no reliable method of achieving measurements of the sort of accuracy that were necessary to perform that experiment. And so he dismissed both experiments as unworkable. And no one actually challenged this, whether you know, there's no, it's not, clear why, but actually both tests were theoretically possible and theoretically we, we, people were capable of, of performing those experiments at that time. So moving back on to the development of ideas of, of the earth, the, uh, the next great thinker to emerge was George Buffon, a fascinating chap. Um, he really tried to reconcile various sources of evidence, so particularly natural history, geology and anthropology. 
And he also, he came up with a few, couple of wild theories, which actually were are also quite entertaining. One was the, the he, had a, he had a theory that the formation of the earth was caused by a glancing blow, blow to the sun by a passing planet, uh, sorry, passing comet. And he also had an answer for one of the great mysteries of the age, which was the appearance of fossils of weird and wonderful animals, some of them absolutely huge. And people were trying to reconcile the, 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 appear of the, the fossils of these things that didn't exist. Extinction wasn't really a, a concept at that time. And he, he came up with a theory that the, based on the fact that the earth must have been extremely hot after the creation, his theory was that the earth, as it cooled, uh, or when it was hot, the, it was populated by these huge animals, which because of their size could cope with great heat. But as the earth cooled from the, pool, from the poles, these, the, the animals migrated towards the equator to stay in warmer climes. And obviously when they got to the equator and it continued to cool down, then the, those animals could no longer survive. And so he was one of the first people to pro provide a logical theory for the increasing evidence that there, was, that there had been mass extinctions of species that uh, had, you know, more, probably more species had disappeared than had ever, had ever appeared in the first place. He also had a theory that uh, the seven days of creation were actually a metaphor. And in 1778, he published a, um, a publication called the Epoch de la Nature, where he postulated that um, the, seven, the, the, the seven days of creation, as I say, were a metaphor. And that therefore the earth could be much, much older than 6,000 years. And he in fact postulated that it was 75,000 years. And, but it was only say, given pretty much as an example. And there is evidence that actually he, he recognized it was probably much, much older than that, but felt that that was too great a message to, to pass to, on to people. It was too, just would not be credible. But whatever, it was actually a, a eureka moment in many ways because the idea of the seven, the, the, the church's line of creation was becoming more and more untenable. The seven days of creation was becoming more untenable. And so he supplied a, a get out, if you like, because the, these using the seven days as a metaphor meant that you could still fit the idea of a slowly created work earth against the book of creation and so that really opened up or released some of the shackles really on people who didn't want to go against convention and allowed more scientific thought so he was followed quite quite soon by james hutton um, who very interesting chap. Um, he basically he went to law school, uh, decided he didn't like that. He then qualified as an MD, decided he didn't decided he didn't like that. Moved to Scotland to become a farmer, but then read extensively on science, and he travelled in particularly earth science, and he travelled extensively as well, and. He found evidence, particularly in his local rock strata in uh, near Edinburgh. He found he saw that the Earth was had been, or the, that area of the Earth must have been created by a number of events that were piled on top of each other, and he recognised this. Uh, uh, the processes of deposition and subsidence and uplift and erosion and could see all of these processes tumbled on top of each other and 
pro those processes stopping and starting again and he real and he also recognized the role of heat and pressure as well in the formation of the earth and he rec and so he published this volume the theory of the earth it was quite an accessible volume and the groundbreaking thing for him there was that he were, he was able to um he 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 sort of expanded the time scales he, he there was a great the great line in it where he said that the age of the earth must be in, inconceivably great we find no vestige of a beginning and no prospect of an end and and so he again he opened up this thought that the earth could be old beyond imagination once again it, re it created there was much resistance to his theories and people struggled with the concept that the time time scales could be so long but again it set the stage for modern geological science to be developed based on this continuing process of formation and destruction that uh, led to the topology we see so so this information became accessible it was widely published in popular magazines it was well read and he created a fascination and uh, you know obviously there was pressure building for that fascination but his his studies really and his writings created an interest for people people realized that they were looking at things that were ages and ages old and so they wanted to peer into that they wanted to go into the mountains and they wanted to peer into what was effectively a time machine and um, mountain tourism and landscape tourism and expedition and exploration as well all grew to become quite popular you know very popular and as an example Mont Blanc was first summited in 1786 the first matter of the Matterhorn was in 1865 and by the end of the 1800s virtually all of the alpine peaks had been explored and so people were starting to look further afield the, to the Himalayan peaks and the Andean peaks uh, and one fascinating thing I think that has a modern corollary that was actually even mentioned in the the general chit chat that was going on before this presentation started um, is that people would tell you, it, it was quite popular in the early 1800s for people to, when they went up a mountain, they would pack a thermometer, some water, and the means to boil it. And they would get up to the top of the mountain, they'd light their fire, put the water on the stove, stick the, stick the thermometer in, it, in, the, in the water, and then sort of gasp and awe at the fact that the water was boiling before it had actually reached boiling point and that was a way for them to reach out and feel the science and actually you know the modern corollary for me is all of us who have downloaded the iss app so we can go running out uh, you know, on the appropriate night look at the appropriate point, point of the sky and see the iss going over and it's it, you know it's a way of touching the science and being part of that science and I, I think it's I think it's absolutely brilliant that both you know 250 years ago and today we're still doing that we still have that same fascination that same desire to understand and be a part of something which is far far greater than you know, things we can imagine. I, I put in this clip. I'll let you, I'll let you read the highlight because um, oh, actually maybe I should read it, read it for people who are on small screens. But it, it, it amused me because it, it sort of gave a. On the one hand, it gives an insight into how popular tourism in, in mountains and, and wildernesses was. On the other hand, it also gives a, uh, a, a view, an insight to the prejudices of the time. So the the part I'm, I've highlighted is that. Uh, quote, 
even women are amply indemnified for the fatigue of the journey by the pleasure arising from the view of objects entirely new to them. Now that was published in 1801 and it really sums up the, and it's a popular magazine at the time, and it really sums up the attitudes of the time, not just with respect to the, you know, the, the magic mountains, but also to you know, the view of women at that time, you know, totally patronising and uh, you know, shows how we, we have moved on, thank goodness. The last person I wanted to mention before moving on to uh, the uh, attraction of mountains was uh, is Charles Lyle. Um, he, again, amazing chap. He was a very prescient thinker. He was, um, if you like, he was the Bill Bryson of his time. He read extensively on the geology and earth science, and he translated the torturous language of the scientists into a very accessible and very popular and readable uh, publication. Had the, the snappy title of Principles of Geology and attempt to explain the former changes of the Earth's surface by reference to causes now in operation. Fortunately, that was probably the most ungainly part of the whole publication. And it became a, an unlikely bestseller. It was a hugely popular book and it made, it made science, the science of geology accessible to people. It explained things in terms that the, the, the non-scientists could understand. And um, it was really, along with the general thought at that time, it was um, a, a key in really turning the wilderness and mountains into something to be feared, into something that was beautiful to be enjoyed and uh, something of wonderment. It's also interesting that Lyle, in talking about this evolutionary development of the earth in an accessible and understandable way, he really set the stage for the evolution of species. And he, his, his publications were actually widely read by Darwin and Darwin did credit Lyle as someone who was a great formative thinker for him. And he is known to have read Lyle's volumes extensively on the voyage of the Beagle. And um, he, and yeah, it, it's, it, it's highly likely that Lyle helped to put Darwin into that mindset where he, uh, postulated the uh, the, the uh, natural selection. Interestingly, Lyle didn't immediately accept the Darwin, the origin of species, but he did come around to accept it as a, a valid and uh, likely um, process. Okay, so now we're going to change gear and we're going to go to the science rather than the science history. Uh, so we're back to my favourite mountain, Shahalian, and uh, uh, as you ascend Shahalian, there is a plaque at the bottom, at, at the foot of the footpath. I will read the plaque as I'm, I guess some of you are on small screens and probably can't read it. The plaque reads, in the summer of 1774, the Reverend Neville, Neville Maskeline, FRS, Astronomer Royal, set up observatories on either side of Shahalian to measure by how much plumb lines would be pulled out of the vertical and towards the mountain by the gravitational force due to its mass. At the time, this was called the attraction of mountains. In effect, it became the first determination of Newton's universal gravitational constant. The mountain was surveyed by Ruben Barrow of the Royal Observatory Greenwich. The calculations were made by the mathematician Charles Hutton, FRS, during which he was the first to use land surface contour lines now universally employed in map making. So, the, although the plaque says that he effectively measured the universal gravitational constant, that wasn't actually an objective of the experiment. The objective of the experiment was to work out the mass of the heavenly bodies by, first of all, working out the mass of the Earth. Um, the, it, it, we talk about the universal gravitational equation in different ways. Uh, today as they did then. In those days, it 
the, if you like, the gra universal gravitational equation was seen as a, a, a bit of a bit part, as it were. And so there was no attempt from this, uh, from this experiment to define G. Um, but the, it, it was a, an inevitable consequence of the, uh, the experiment that the gravitational constant could be defined. So, but it, you know, often people say that the experiment was done to define the universal gravitational constant. It wasn't, it was done to define the mass of the Earth. But as I say, a consequence of that was that you could calculate the gravitational constant. Again, you have to go back a bit to earlier science to understand the motivation for the experiment. So in 1716, Edmund Halley had proposed that an expedition should be launched to, uh, to observe the transit of Venus across the sun. And that would allow a determination of the distance from the Earth to the sun to be made. And Neville Maskelyne, who at that time was a, um, a, an astronomer within the, the Royal Society, was sent to St Helena to perform that observation. There were a number of similar experiments that carried out by other nations as well. And in actual fact, the, the 1761 transit experiment was a complete failure because of the weather, there was nothing to see. And so fortunately, there was another transit of Venus in 1769. Um, and Maskelyne, who was by then the, the Astronomer Royal, uh, supported a, or approved a, 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 a uh, expedition to Tahiti. Uh, this was carried out by Thomas Cook, uh, not Thomas Cook, <laughs> yeah. uh, James Cook even. Um, and uh, that expedition was also considered a failure, but this time it was for a different reason. In fact, what it was was that um, they found that with the optical equipment they had, that as, the, as, the, the, as Venus approached the perimeter of the sun, the, the, Venus, the, the disk of Venus transformed into a blob and it bled into the sun. Uh, that was a completely unknown effect. And um, for those of you who attended John Wilkes's discussion about the limitations of optics and such like, that was exactly in a manifestation of the limitations of optical equipment. It was a, an effect called the black drop effect. And it, you, you could have a whole hour lecture <laughs> and a talk on that. Uh, but basically it boils back down to the point spread, point spread function of the telescope and its inability to resolve uh, sharp borders, if you like. Um, ironically, the, the result of the experiment was actually incredibly accurate. The estimation of the distance to the sun was 93.7 million miles. Uh, and the, the, the accepted value, as I'm sure you all know, is just a shift for the mean distance is just a shade under 93 million miles. So, that, so the result was actually within 1% of the, the true value. But because of the uncertainty on the measurements, they had no confidence in that result. And in reality, it was probably through a combination of luck and very careful extrapolation and interpolation of the results that they got such an accurate result. But anyway, that as a result, in 1772, Maskelyne then proposed a that the equipment that would be freed up from the expedition to Tahiti would be perfect for performing a, an attraction of mountains experiment and um, he proposed that when the equipment returned it should be taken to a mountain somewhere in the UK to perform the experiment. There was another motivation as well, the French had actually tried to perform such an experiment on a peak in Peru uh, about 30 years earlier and they had failed miserably 
the reason they had failed was actually nothing to do with the science. It was to do with the climate. They were taking their measurements at a, an altitude of just under uh, 5,000 meters. And so they experienced horrendous weather conditions. And that was the only thing that made that expedition fail. Having said that, it did fail, and there's nothing that will motivate the British more than being able to beat the French. So there was the he his he was very keen that, that we that the experiment was performed, and so it was well funded. It had the equipment that was left over from the transit Venus experiment, and um, at the time Scotland was a pretty wild and unpleasant place. Uh, especially that region, there was nothing there. Uh, Shehalian is in the geographic centre of, uh, of Scotland pretty much and there's no major settlements around there. So no one would be, no one was really willing to go there. So Maskelyne, despite being an astronomer role, he ended up going to Scotland to perform the measurements himself. Short diversion, and really this is just for the edification of John Miller. Um, I, I know John has a, a fascination with ancient timepieces, and I thought I would just mention that the uh, this is actually the clock that went to um, to Tahiti uh, with the Captain James Cook expedition, and also then was transported up to both sides of Shehalian. Uh, for the Attraction of Mountains experiment and it's still visible. It's in the National Museum of Scotland in Edinburgh so it can be seen today. It's a very well-travelled clock. Fascinatingly as well, it was used um, right way through to the early 1900s. Had several modifications along the way so it's very difficult to find out what sort of accuracy it, it, it provided. But Chronological accuracy was very important, as you'll see in the uh, Attractions of Mountains experiment. I need to speed up a bit. Um, so, Shehalian, quick site, quick uh, diversion, bit of levity here for you. So, uh, as you can see, Shehalian is a mountain which, certainly from the east-west aspect, is a, a nice perfect cone. You'll see from the map in the bottom left-hand corner that it's in the middle of nowhere. Uh, the map in the right hand corner, it's in the middle of the um, geographic centre of Scotland pretty much. And um, from the bottom right you'll see that it has a, uh, it has steep north and south faces which would, were good for getting the pendulums into, uh, you know, close to the mountain. And um, it has, but it's also a long thin mountain so it has a High, high mass. For the Oregonians here, I thought I would also include a, a picture of a mountain that they know well. Uh, very, very similar profile to, uh, to Shehalian. And this is the is Mount Hood, the volcano, extinct volcano. And, um, well, it may be active actually, you, you guys can probably correct me on that. And uh, it's, uh, Interestingly, to you will see from the map on the left that to get to Shehalian, you have to drive down a um, a highway, not really a big highway, and you go through the you travel through the Happen of Dull and pass through the village of Dull, and there indeed is a picture of the uh, the highway. Similarly, in Oregon, to get to uh, Mount Hood, you travel down the Mount Hood Highway and you travel past the town of Boring. Now it seems that the residents of Dull and Boring have picked up on this <laughs> and Dull and Boring have been twins so there is a, a spiritual synergy between Shehalian and Mount Hood. I'm sure the Oregonians will be pleased to know that. That's cool. Back to the serious stuff. Um, so the attraction of mountains basically the experiment relies on the fact that uh, the, you're using the plumb lines to measure the vertical of the um, reference. So you're looking at distant stars. The, the stars were actually observed at their zenith as they crossed the, um, the north-south um, meridian, uh, hence the need for the chronological accuracy so you knew exactly when they were at the meridian. 
And nor if you take away the mountain from this picture, size is slightly exaggerated, um, if you take the mountain away, then you would expect there to be a difference between the measurements from the two, two locations on the north south face and the south face of the mountain that would be equal to two theta because the vertical would be measured as the, uh, as the line to the center of the earth or the center of gravity of the earth, which would be assumed to be the center of the earth. If you use the plumb lines for your vertical reference though, they are going to have a slight attraction to the mountain. And so the me measure the difference you would then expect between the two measurements would be two theta, two, uh, two phi. And so the, the experiment relied on this measurement, this very small deflection. As was said in the plaque, there was a very accurate geographical survey of the mountain and in particular obviously the survey sites, uh, the observation sites on the north and uh, south faces were particularly relevant and the geographical difference, the distance between them was 1,430 yards. That made the value of, uh, of two, 2 theta 42.94 arc seconds. And you'll remember from those who were at uh, Ed Friedman's discussion, he talked about arc seconds in the uh, um, observation of the 19, I'm going to say 15, I think it was 15 eclipse. Um, an arc second, uh, one arc second is a 3,600th of a degree. So without Shehalian, the expected geographical difference would have been 40, virtually 43 seconds. The measured difference was actually 54.6 seconds. And so this could lead to very simple maths because the expected, um, a calculation was performed for the mass of Shehalian. And it was, and if you assumed the Earth was of the same density as Shehalian, so the Earth was just made up of Shehalians, then you would expect a, a deviation due to the Shehalian of 20.9 seconds. And so from that, it's very simple to then show that therefore the density of the Earth must be 20.9, 11.6 of the density of Shehalian. And so that led to a preliminary estimate of the Earth's density of two and a half times that of Shalian. And because from that you could calculate the volume of the Earth, uh, sorry, the, ma the mass of the Earth, and because we knew all the other factors for the equations, uh, for the gravitational equation, apart from the mass of the Earth, that allowed, but just by simple ratios, the calculation of the mass of all the heavenly bodies uh, within the solar system. Now, it, again, going back to Ed Friedman's discussion uh, a few weeks ago, he introduced the concept of the equivalent dis distance of car headlight separation um, for the, the, the visualization of what a few seconds actually equates to. Uh, I've called it the EDOX, which is clearly a, a Scottish unit. And um, if this equates to measuring the separation of car headlights from a distance of 16.7 miles. So considering this measurement was performed some 250 years ago, I, I think that's pretty impressive that they managed to get it so, so right. Um, what, what I should say is that there were a few, um, the accuracy of the experiment was enhanced by the fact that readings were taken from both sides of the mountain. Um, the uh, Maskelyne actually spent three months on Shehalian. A An observatory was built on both the north face and the south face. A bothy was built for him to live in next to one to the, the observatory on the north face. And he basically spent seven weeks on the north, face, north side taking 169 readings of 39 starts. Um, 
and then everything was packed up moved to the south side face of the mountain and he observed 100 or took 168 observations of 37 stars in seven weeks so he had plenty of observations to be able to cancel errors the fact that he was on the north side and the south side meant that you had subtractive calculations so that removed a lot of the errors of that would have occurred from just a single observation from a single point and uh, it also removed collimation errors from the telescope and then the, with the accuracy of the time time pieces available they could also correct for precession of the earth and there were some other error sources which frankly i don't really i had i don't know the detail of how they were cancelled but certain aberrations for example optical aberrations were corrected for too and so the result was remarkably accurate um the and the um the, those re the preliminary results were published in 1775 in fact but they were just preliminary results and um which was the 20.6 sorry 20 point to 11.6 um but it took another two years to complete the survey survey of the mountain and, and in fact in many ways the survey of the mountain was as impressive a task as the actual observations themselves and the role of hutton and burrows is often overlooked but as was mentioned in the plaque burrows had to slice the mountain to, to calculate the mass he had to slice the mountain into sections um, and correct for the different strata within the mountain and he developed a technique of joy of interpolating between the various readings that the, the thousands of ob surveying observations that he made uh, he interpolated between them to draw lines between areas of equal elevation and that was the the first use of contour lines which obviously is a, you know, a technique which has been propagated ever since so just winding up uh, i think this is my last slide so this is the last physical remains of the uh the work that was carried out the uh, the observation, the south side observatory, there is no trace of anymore. This is on the north face. You can stroll up to it. Um, have to bash your way through a load of heather, but uh, it's uh, it, it's quite satisfying to stand there and know that you're standing where uh, the first measurement of the or the first cal calculation of the uh, mass of planet Earth was made. And what you're seeing here is the footings of both the observatory and the boffy that was built and actually sorry this is my last slide uh so, so this is my punchline slide which uh, to say that this is a photo on the peak of shahalian taken in modern times and uh, it still holds its original attraction so that is the end of my presentation uh thank you very much i'm now ready to take easy questions Yeah. I'll ask one. Oh, sorry, is someone else going? Oh, you go first, Scott. I'll follow. Thanks. Okay, so um, uh, Neil, uh, first fascinating talk. I mean, uh, I really appreciate it. I can't imagine how they measured the angle that accurately. Um, but my question is, so so I don't know these other effects. Just out of curiosity, do you know if rotation of the Earth, you know, if you do different points with it, how significant that was as far as changing the results? Yeah, I think you said they were north and south. So, I mean. Uh, that that could dominate do, do, do you know anything about uh, yeah the rotation of the, the precession of earth was certainly a factor because obviously you know you've got the rotation of the stars so that's why there was a need to have a very accurate timepiece um wow. because they had to be absolutely sure that it was on the north south meridian yeah i guess i guess you're talking about timing the meridian i'm just wondering whether you know this is a ball that's hanging the earth is whipping around and depending on how far latitude you are, I would think whether the ball would get pulled, you know, just from the fact we're spinning around, right? 
Does that make sense? Like if you're at the equator, the ball would be oh, I see what you're saying. Straight yeah. up. But if you're at the North Pole, it would spin around. You know, um, I, I don't know. Maybe that's not significant. I'm just just curious. Yeah, I I guess that um, that might have been part of the reason for measuring it on the North South Meridian because I guess then you're you're only looking at the vertical. So um, any offset on the horizontal would not be significant. That's a that's pure guess, to be honest. I don't know. Um, but you also said you don't know how they managed to get quite so, so accurate. I, I, likewise, I, I find it incredible that they managed to measure such a small angle. That, Inconceivable. That time. But, yeah, but, but one of the reasons was that uh, they, the fact they took so many readings and that many of those readings had compensatory errors. And so that, you know, the, the 168 readings, you know, I, I'm not sure what, ha what happens to that when you RSS it, it, it must diminish the, um, the, the error quite significantly, but still, you know, a mind boggling achievement really. I couldn't do it. I know that. All right. Thanks. <laughs> okay. uh, I have a couple of questions. Um, I was wondering, how did they get this accurate uh, measurement of the distance between the two observation posts on, on either side of, of the mountain? Yeah, there's not a lot of information available on that. Uh, the, the, um, the, the, there was a lot of, a huge number of measurements were taken and a lot of surveying techniques were developed um you know new techniques were developed to allow the survey to be performed uh, it was also quite a big science at that time because there were a lot of things where detailed surveying was being performed on exploration partly for mapping and uh, uh, um and and it it's it really the sheer number of points that were taken that rendered the accuracy of the surveying um as i say it's you know, charles hutton was really a, an unsung un, unsung hero really um and uh it's something i want to look into more i must admit because the the surveying was clearly you know a, an achievement in itself oh, sorry i can't give you a full uh, you know more more expansive answer than that okay uh the other question may be something i missed uh, that you said, but um, observing the transit of Venus, uh, did I understand you to say that enabled them to calculate the distance from the Earth to the Sun, not of Venus to the Sun? Uh, yes, it was from the Earth to the Sun because they knew the size of Venus from um, from observations and the uh, the, um, the, the the size of the orbit and the periodicity of the orbit and such like, and so by measuring the time to transit the the sun, um, which they knew the size of and the speed of Venus, they were able to make an approximation to the size um, to they could, that that would allow them to calculate the uh, the distance to the sun. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You know, just a, a couple of comments because I, I teach astronomy at university. So, Excellent. Uh, <laughs> so first, yeah, in, in, in terms of uh, the last question, I mean, even Newton knew the relative sizes of the orbits of the planets, right? I mean, that, that yes. had, and, and in fact, in the Principia, there is a discussion of, uh, of Kepler's laws of the uh, relation between the orbital period and the uh, orbital radius and, and, and that, that calculation. Uh, a second thing that's interesting about the church is if you, if you go back, uh, some people have thought that, that only the Medicis saved uh, Galileo from being burnt at the stake because Giordano Bruno, who taught the same thing uh, at roughly the same time, was in fact burned at the stake for heresy. And, and the last comment is if you look at uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the writings of Kepler on called the, on a new astronomy, it actually begins with a, something, and I'll give a, 
bad translation of the Latin from a fair memory, uh, but, but essentially that, that this is dedicated to the greater glory of God and surely God had intended us to understand the, the, the mysteries of the universe. In other words, it's very sort of gentle introduction, you know, like uh, all these pictures that one has from the states of, uh, of the British Parliament where, you know, the esteemed so-and-so and you're then going to totally <laughs> oppose him. So they're just uh, a few things. Uh, the transits uh, we measure trivially now with uh, rather small telescopes. We did a transit uh, experiment at, at Simon's Rock. Uh, so it, it just shows how much optics has improved and how you really have to think these people were phenomenally good observers. Uh, Galileo's telescope was roughly today's 10 by 50 binoculars. So, I mean. Mm. Uh, what he discovered. <laughs> but just, just a few comments from us. I, I, had yeah, a, I, had, I think I one of the other things. I would like to add a question, actually. I want to go back to sort of a societal question. Can't hear you. In the beginning, when you're talking about the church not receiving all this well, what were the Islam nations and the Asian nations doing? I, yeah. They were I, I, not tracking the you know the spheres in the in the world and the, and the mm -hmm. I and and this yeah I, I confess this is an area of ignorance of mine. I, it's oh, I not that the there's a lot of scripture on a lot of uh, publications on. Um I it's something I do want to look into because I'm sure you know the I mean, astronomical observations go back you know thousands of years. And uh, right. you know, so we look at Stonehenge, have which have is basically a huge. And not have to worry about the church. They must. There must. There must have been some really cool stuff going on there. The, the, there's some evidence that they. Uh, and, and I'm I'm not enough of a scholar to do this, but I've seen the the. Uh, and we 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 cite a little bit of this in the history in, in my astronomy course that that they had actually anticipated Kepler that, that some of the diagrams look look surprisingly similar as if uh, I read, right I read an article that the Babylonians were like they saw the moon of Saturn or you know way ahead of us mm, you needed a telescope to do that so I don't know I mean yeah, I don't know either they're, they're trivial with a telescope yeah. try it with a 10 by 50 binoculars on a moving, that was in the journal of science and they were like had a move yeah. way into uh, into algebra, but either way, yeah. But it's 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 cool to it, it, for our society. It was definitely entwined with the church. It'd be interesting to see what the rest of the world do, was doing. Yeah, I, okay, I think um, as well as, as well as the church, there's the uh, it, you have to appreciate actually the enormity of what people were right. being presented with as well because. You know, you had the astronomy astronomers telling people that, you know, rather than the world being a nice, simple center of everything and a, a, a relatively small place, suddenly they were opening up the vastness of the cosmos. And at the same time, you had other people, which I didn't touch on, but you had the, the, the first micro, microscope was patented in 1604. And so they were also drilling down into the detail as well and finding that you know, the, the world was an intricately detailed place as well. And so the, the, you know, the, 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 there was a vastness occurring at both ends of the size spectrum. And the, you know, quite apart from the church, that must have been a very hard thing for people to grasp at that, at that point. You know, a lot of certainty was suddenly being re removed. And you know all that dogma was suddenly being challenged. So it it, it must have been a, an extremely exciting time to be around. But it's and interesting. Let's let's um that's what I was let's give John about. Miller a chance here to uh, introduce his talk for next week. Okay. <laughs> well, hi guys. Uh, I, I worked on this shuttle. I'll, I'll I'll show some pictures that I took of the inside of the left wing of the Columbia. Um, We'll talk about it with 2020 hindsight. I mean, we all have that. I got to admit that. Uh, but the good stuff of the shuttle, the bad stuff, and some of the ugly. 
of uh, what went wrong and uh, where NASA and more more than NASA, where politicians frankly screwed it up. So. And Bruce, I, I, I need to talk to you or John Wilson. I want to do a dry run because I got some videos and other things I want to make sure play. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm uh, on vacation up here right up. babysitting, so uh, I, I'm available. And, uh, yeah. And uh, Peter, are you online? Because uh, you told me uh, your artificial intelligence was going to be geared towards imagery. I guess he's not on here. But he was looking to, to gear his uh, 20, July 29th talk towards uh, imaging science. Okay. And we're looking for uh, m more speakers after Ed Friedman on August 12th. So, so I think uh, I've noticed a couple of people here that seem like they may uh, have some skills in the speaking arena. So if, if you are such a person, um, how about you, Harold? Yeah. You sound pretty knowledgeable. Yeah, I, I, I could talk about uh, either some stuff on complexity or, or some joint work that we're doing on uh, on the motion and nervous system of C. elegans, which is a, a tiny uh, nematode that, that has the advantage that the, the entire neural structure has been mapped. Uh, or, or I could uh, grab some, some stuff from uh, the uh, presentations that that I've given in class, either in astronomy or in climate change. I mean, so uh, I guess wow. uh, I, I must have your email, Bruce, or, or Howard has my email, and, and so uh, you know. Okay, uh, Howard Edelman. Yeah, Howard Edelman has it. We Perfect. he introduced me to this. We used to right. two, two blocks. Well, Tommy, how about you, man? How about you giving a talk? Well, thanks a lot, Neil. Nice to hear from you. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. Yeah. Okay. All right, guys, this is the end of Science for the Board for today. Thank you so much for participating, and uh, we'll uh, say goodbye. Thank you, and the speakers, as always. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nice job, Neil. Awesome. Wonderful. Thank you. Really, fun. really cool. Yep. Thank you. <clears throat>